Hi everyone, welcome back to Connected Rheumatology. I'm Dr. Elizabeth Ortiz. Here at Connected Rheumatology, we like to talk about all things rheumatology, immunology, diet and movement, mental health and wellness because we believe it is all connected. Connected Rheumatology is a rheumatology practice based out of Dallas, Texas, and we pride ourselves on comprehensive, state-of-the-art care that we believe should include education. And that is what this channel is for. We talk about some common and sometimes not so common topics that oftentimes come up in a rheumatology appointment. I know firsthand that these rheumatology appointments we are given are short and sometimes we leave with more questions than answers and so we hope to get into some of those issues here at the youtube channel so if that sounds like something you'd be interested in make sure you hit subscribe and like this video that helps us know that you want to hear more and gets us in front of more eyeballs all right, so today we're going to be talking about a topic that we briefly touched on a few weeks ago when we discussed scleroderma, and that is Raynaud's syndrome. Now, June is Scleroderma Awareness Month, and although scleroderma is reasonably rare, Raynaud's syndrome and the symptoms of Raynaud's isn't. And figuring out what it means, what you should do about it, and whether or not you should see a specialist for it is often something a lot of people don't even think about. So today we're going to get into the top three questions I always get about Raynaud's. Let's get into it. All right, number one, what is Raynaud's syndrome? And how do you pronounce it? So it's pronounced Raynaud's. You'll sometimes hear people say Raynaud's. In fact, I think I said Raynaud's in the scleroderma video. I go back and forth, but it's Raynaud's syndrome. So what is it? Well, it is an over-exaggerated vascular response. So what does that mean? Well, it is natural and normal when your hands or any part of you is exposed to extreme cold or stress for the blood vessels to clamp down so that all the blood and the heat of the body stays around the organs. And it's a way for your body to protect itself. Your body, when it's super cold, doesn't want to be sending all its blood and heat to parts of the body that aren't considered vital. And as much as we need our hands, we need our heart and our lungs and our kidneys a little bit more. So when exposed to cold, the body's response is to clamp down in our limbs and our fingers and our toes to keep all the warmth and the blood in our trunk, as that's normal. When you have Raynaud's, however, that reaction to cold and to stress is a little exaggerated. And so the vessels will constrict and they'll hold on to that constriction just a little bit longer and they'll be a little bit tighter than someone who doesn't have this condition. Now, the true incidence of Raynaud's is tough, to, is tough to say. You know, it really depends on the study you're looking at, and some studies have defined Raynaud's from everything from just having cold hands and cold feet to having the true color changes that we see. So, the numbers range anywhere from 5 to 30%. And Raynaud's can happen by itself, or it can happen in conjunction with another condition. So when you have Raynaud's, there it is. So when you have Raynaud's and that's all you have, we call that primary Raynaud's. When your Raynaud's is in conjunction with some other condition, for example, an autoimmune condition like scleroderma, we will call it secondary Raynaud's. Now, primary Raynaud's tends to happen in women between the ages of 15 and 30. There are risk factors for developing primary Raynaud's, and that includes having a family history of it, taking in nicotine, whether it be from smoking or any other way, having migraines, having cardiovascular disease, or having a manual occupation. Secondary Raynaud's, again, is associated with a number of different conditions. So in the autoimmune world, we see Raynaud's with scleroderma, with lupus, with myositis, and with Sjogren's syndrome. You can also see Raynaud's in various hematologic conditions. Hematologic just means blood disorders. And you can see Raynaud's associated with the use of various different medications, most specifically different chemotherapies. 
Also, we see Raynaud is associated with hypothyroidism or low thyroid. All right, question number two, how do I know I have it and then how do I know if it's secondary or primary? Okay, well the first thing to understand is that Raynaud's is more than just having cold hands. This is a point of confusion for a lot of patients. Having cold hands or feet may in fact be related to having an underlying condition such as cardiovascular disease or an autoimmune condition, but a lot of times it's just the way you are. Raynaud's is specifically the vasoconstriction that then leads to color changes. So when you have Raynaud's in, there I did it again. So when you have Raynaud's, you'll see color changes in your fingers. All right, so what are the color changes I keep talking about? Well, first, when you have constriction, your fingers will turn white or pallor, as doctors will call it. And that signifies a lack of blood flow. Now, in Raynaud's, if this lack of blood flow persists, as it does with Raynaud's, then that color will go from white to blue. And the blue indicates cyanosis, otherwise known as a lack of oxygen to those tissues. Now, the white-blue part of Raynaud's can last anywhere between 15 and 20 minutes. Afterwards, you'll have a rewarming of the fingertips, and the fingers will then turn red. So you go from white to blue to red. Now this entire process can be associated with numbness and tingling and pain. In fact, a lot of patients are surprised to find that the rewarming stage can actually be the most painful. All right, so those are the color changes, but now you need to ask yourself, is that what is happening to your hands? So these would be questions for you to ask. What do your hands do and how do they feel when you are washing something in cold water? Or when you put your hand in the freezer to pull something out? Or when you're shopping in the freezer section of the grocery store? Do you notice your fingertips changing color? Well, that can indicate Raynaud's. So the second part of this question, is it primary or secondary, may require the help of your doctor, either your primary care doctor or a rheumatologist. Things to ask yourself, do you have a known autoimmune condition, such as scleroderma, myositis, lupus, or Sjogren's? Do you have a blood disorder? Do you have thyroid problems? If you have these conditions, it may very well be that your Raynaud's is related to those conditions. One thing to keep in mind in the autoimmune world is that Raynaud's is very common, but in conditions such as rheumatoid arthritis or psoriatic arthritis, it actually isn't very common. So if you find that you have those conditions or one of those conditions, and you are now developing Raynaud's, well, that might be something to talk about your rheumatologist. If you have a known thyroid problem and then you develop Raynaud's, well, that might indicate that your thyroid isn't well controlled and you might need some medication adjustments. Now, if you were to go see a rheumatologist, for Raynaud's and you're concerned that perhaps it is a sign that you have an underlying autoimmune condition, it is not unusual for your rheumatologist to do a complete physical head to toe looking for any other subtle signs that you might have missed that may indicate an underlying autoimmune condition. One of the things they're going to look at, however, oftentimes surprises people and that is looking at your nail bed capillaries. I know, <laughs> what is that? <laughs> okay, so it's exactly how it sounds like. In your nail beds, they look at the tiny capillaries that reside there. Now we all have capillaries there, but oftentimes they're, na they're impossible to see with the naked eye. Now, if you have Raynaud's, sometimes what they can see is that those capillaries are dilated and they're twisty and they turn. Now. They oftentimes can't see this with the naked eye and they will need some sort of magnifying tool to be able to see them. If you have Raynaud's and then the doctor finds that in some of your digits, some of your fingers, that the nail bed capillaries are dilated or twisty, that may mean that you have a higher risk of either having or developing an autoimmune condition down the road. Now, rest assured, most of you watching this that have Raynaud's will not have abnormal or dilated nail bed capillaries, but just something for you to keep in mind that that is something your doctor is going to look for when you go get a consult. 
And if you find yourself right now staring at your nail beds, well, just know that you're in good company. When I lecture on this topic to medical students and to medical residents, the entire audience stops to look at their fingers. <laughs> All right, and then question number three. Well, what can I do about my Raynaud's? How do I treat it? Well, you know, the simple tried and true answer is to keep your hands warm. And that doesn't mean just in winter time, but even in summer, as sometimes walking into a building that's blasting the AC can trigger a flare of the Raynaud's. So how do you keep your hands warm? Well, of course you can stick them in your pockets, but we always recommend having gloves everywhere. Gloves need to be a part of your look. And I mean gloves in the car, in your bag, in your backpack, in the house, in your pockets. Always have gloves around. If you find that you don't have gloves, sticking your hands in some warm water will also do the trick. When you're dealing with Raynaud's, that's really the treatment. There's no supplement or no diet change that's been shown to have any real impact. Now, if you have secondary Raynaud's and you have an underlying condition, then treating that underlying condition can oftentimes make a small impact on the severity of your Raynaud's, but we still fall back on that tried and true keeping your hands warm with gloves. Occasionally, we will use medications, medications that we oftentimes actually use for blood pressure that we know the way they work is by dilating blood vessels. We will use those medications in people with Raynaud's who gloves are just simply not enough to try to keep those blood vessels open. We've got medicines that are both oral that you take in a pill form and topical, so in a cream form. So if you find yourself that you're wearing your gloves religiously and you're still having problems, then you can go talk to your doctor about possibly starting a medication to try to keep those blood vessels open. So you might be asking yourself, like, what's the big deal? If all the problem is is that my fingers turn colors and they get a little numb, like, what's the big deal? And, you know, it's true. If you have primary Raynaud's, the statistics are definitely in your favor that there will be few or no long-term consequences. However, in some cases, both primary and secondary Raynaud's, it can lead to serious problems. Having repeated episodes where parts of your fingertips are not receiving the oxygen that they need can result in poor wound healing or even worse. And these are problems that you just don't want to have, so just wear gloves. And as an aside, if the reason you are having Raynaud's is because of nicotine use, then stopping the nicotine will help with the Raynaud's, if not completely resolve it. So that's it. Those are my answers to the top three questions I get about Raynaud's. I hope it offered some explanation, got you thinking, maybe gets you writing some questions down for your own doctor. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. Make sure you subscribe, because here at Connected Rheumatology, we talk about all things rheumatology, immunology, diet and movement, mental health, and wellness, because it's all connected. Oh, and don't forget to come follow us on Instagram and Facebook. I always forget to mention that, but I'm over there too. <laughs> Have a great day.